He won't forget the licking. He got from that big chicken. Now, now he, he gets, gets his poultry from, from the store. <laughs> from the cast of the Disney Magic and the world-famous Disney characters. W Radio, your information station. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangiello, and this is show number 745, and together, as we have been since 2004, I want to not only help you have the best possible Disney vacation experience, but also bring you a little bit of Disney magic wherever you are, here on the podcast, my weekly live video every Wednesday night on Facebook, blog, events, weekly newsletter, and more. Please join the community and find everything at www.radio.com. Join me this week as I sit down with former Walt Disney Imagineer Nick Desimov as we dive into the world of groundbreaking design and technology as Nick takes us behind the scenes in creating immersive experiences at the Disney parks. From his work on the magic telescope concept to his role in digitizing characters and designing rock structures, he helps us explore this blend of, of artistry and innovation that goes into crafting some of the magic of Disney that we all enjoy. Then stay tuned for our Disney trivia question of the week and more updates at the end of the show. And if you like what you hear, please share the show and tell a friend. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. I started this show back in 2005, I've always looked to not only share interviews with people from Disney who you've seen on screen or are well-known and, and credited for their work, but really also have and share conversations with you with some of the important creatives and creators whose names you might not know, but whose work you've seen and enjoyed and appreciated for years, sometimes decades. And this week, I want to introduce you to Nick Desimov. He's a former Walt Disney Imagineer, producer, designer, and maker of magic. Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's great being here. It's nice to be able to sit down and just talk to you, discuss this stuff. I don't usually discuss too much of it because I'm always busy and doing <laughs> things. <so. laughs> well, that's good. I love the fact that you're still creative, creating, and I'm I'm very excited to talk about with you because there are so many different aspects to your career, uh, specifically at Disney and Imagineering. But I like to start at the beginning. I am a, you know, I'm a comic book nerd, so I love the origin story. Give me, give me a little bit of the the Nick Desimov origin story and, and how you got started with Disney. Oh my! <laughs> I, I don't know how far I need to go back. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll briefly just cover how I got you know, to the point where, you know, I got into Disney is I, I started working in the film industry literally when I was 15 years old as a summer job, sweeping floors for small special effects studios in, in, in Hollywood. And, and, and that was during my summer trips to go visit my dad because I lived in Carson City, Nevada. And, and that was my start. So I learned how to make molds and start sculpting. And I had a, an apprenticeship with a mentor who basically worked with me for the next six years of my life. And, and that's what got me started. So, so just having, working on a lot of just these small projects, well, for me, were small projects, but some of them were, were major. Uh, like the first film project I worked on was uh, Star Trek, the, the, the motion picture. And all I did was put stickers on the phasers and, <laughs> and clean up molds and things like that. So it was nothing spectacular, but yeah, man, but every me, Star Trek nerd like me is smiling ear to ear right now because you worked <laughs> on, you know, you worked on V'ger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Good old V'ger. 
And and then also I worked on a TV show where I, I learned how to make molds and start gluing parts to to models for spaceships was for a TV show called Pro- Project UFO. And it was in the 70s. So that was another project, uh, n- another job I had. And that was, you know, my introduction into what would just get me into some just a very eclectic, you know, life of making and creating things. So that gave me the experience of carving and and working with sculpture and doing stuff with clay and working with foam and things like that. And my portfolio was building up where I had a lot of rock stuff, where I was carving stuff for various TV productions and things. And, and, and there was this moment in time where, you know, I had my portfolio put together. It cost $300 to print and color <laughs> portfolios. So I had three of them that I, that I spent my savings on. And it was just this this book of of stuff that I worked on, all my models and my carvings, all my sculptures. And I went through this book. I lived in Los Angeles, so I went through this book called Project Blue Book. And it basically listed all the creative companies in California. And during this time, I'm looking at all of them. There's about 50 of them like that, that I was looking at, the 50 names. And one of them was called WDI. I had no idea what WDI was. Or Imagineering, right? It was like, I think it was listed as WDI Imagineering, but, and I like, oh, it sounds really interesting, Imagineering, right? So I, it was one of the companies I set my book in. While I did that, I was working for, I worked for two companies that kind of prepped me for Disney. And those two companies were, one was called Technifex. And we did a lot of optical mechanical effects for Disney rides and a lot of the stuff that you would see, the, the visual effects that you might see, like Pepper's Ghosts and things like that. And the other one was called Art and Technology. And we sort of did other things for Disney and also for Universal and, and Latte World and Korea. So a lot of theme park related stuff and museums and and zoos in, in the L.A. area. And so this was already, you know, I was already working on Disney things. Not really, you know, knowing what I was going to be doing later, but um but this company, two weeks later, after I sent my, my portfolio through, this company calls me and they go, hi, this is Imagineering. We'd like to bring you in for an interview. <laughs> I went, yeah, okay, yeah. Well, we're at, you know, 1401 Flower Street. That's, it's like, oh, that's like just down the street, literally two blocks from where I was working, you know? <laughs> so I go, okay, great. So me knowing, you know, just the way I am, I, I after I got off the phone, after I, my day of work, I got in my little Volkswagen bug and drove down a couple of blocks and I'm looking at the building and it's just all this kind of old squarish blocky set of buildings, you know, it doesn't look that fascinating, but, but I noticed the, the marquee on the main road to the parking lot and there's a mouse and it's Mickey mouse. I'm like, <laughs> what is that? I mean, what Mickey mouse, what's Mickey mouse doing on this imaginary thing? So two weeks later, I got my interview. I go in, I'm driving in, I park, I go in and, and, um, I can't remember the guy who I interviewed with. Uh, Mike, is it what Mike? Uh, well, his first name was Mike. Anyways, he's sitting there and he's got my portfolio and I sit down and he looks at me and he goes, so he goes, what would you like to do? I went, what do you mean? <laughs> what do I like to do? He goes, what would you like to do here? I said, well, what are you doing? And he goes, well, we got a few projects. We got, we got EDL, which is Euro Disneyland, which I didn't know EDL stood for Euro <laughs> Disneyland, you know? He goes, he goes, we have, we have Typhoon Lagoon, we have going on, we have some other things going on here. And, but look at your work, you know, he goes, we, we want to hire you right off the bat. We need somebody to kind of work in our model division, you know, working as a dimensional designer. And I went, okay. <laughs> you know, you got to understand, I was like 22, 23 years old, you know, and I'm, I'm working in the, in the effects industry pretty much my entire career at starting at 15. And I had no expectation of what I'm getting into. But also, I, I was relatively, you know, astute with learning things on my own. I had bought my own computer. I had a little trash 80 color computer that came from Radio <laughs> Shack. And I taught myself basic programming. And I was also learning generic CAD, which I thought was really fascinating because I could lay out these vector lines and do drawings and stuff like that in 2D. That I did not know would push me into the next level of what I would end up doing at Disney because in the team that I was working with, I was the only one that had any computer experience. And so they throw me into the, so I ended up working for EDL. So I decided to pick EDL. I go, that sounds interesting, EDL. <laughs> you know, okay, what's this? let's go see what this does. They put me in this giant, giant warehouse with a bunch of other modelers and sculptors. 
We all have our own little cubicles and there's a guy running around sweeping floors and, and I'm just like, Oh, wow. There's a guy sweeping floors for us. This is amazing. Cause we usually have to clean up after ourselves and most of the jobs I've done, right. Nobody ever cleans <laughs> up after me. And, and so we sit down and then we, I get in, you know, get introduced to what, what I'm working on. And, and so just, you know, I'm, as an example, I'm carving away and stuff is falling on the floor and all of a sudden there's a broom sweeping it up. I mean, literally it's gone before I realize it. And I'm just totally fascinated with this. You know, it's like, where am I? <laughs> it's like, what, what did I get myself into? By this time it was sinking in. I'm working for Disney, but I didn't realize the theme park aspect of Disney is what I was doing. I always aspired that maybe I would be an artist for, for you know, doing animation, that kind of thing. Never thought about what I was, you know, that I would ever work for a division that did actually design the theme parks and work on that part of it. So you were not, yeah. so you didn't sort of grow up, you know, going to Disney parks or or sort of being enamored with the parks. This was, you know, for you, something that was was relatively new and novel. It was new and novel because, because yes, I, I, I was not raised in Southern California. I grew up, you know, my, my school days from like, Third grade on up was in living in Nevada. I met my dad for like for the first time when I was 15 years old. And that was my introduction to Southern California. But when I was 10, my mother's boyfriend owned this big converted bread truck that he made into a camper. And he grabbed my sister, myself, my mom and himself. And we drove and we went to Disneyland. So I saw Disneyland for the very first, all my friends have been there, you know, the people I knew was, oh my God, Disneyland, Disneyland. I'm like, what is this place? What is this place? I got to see Disneyland for the first time. And all, and I was like, my eyes were probably, you know, were saucer wide and, and I was uh, totally amazed at what I was looking at. And when I went on to like Pirates of the Caribbean and saw the, the pirates and all, all in my head, I was like, oh my God, they're robots. They're robots. These are robots. Oh my God. This is amazing. This is amazing. I just couldn't stop talking about it. And then, of course, you know, and waiting, you know, going on the haunted house and all the adults, because I'm 10 years old, and the adults are just going, yeah, this is great because they use holographic laser technology or something like that. You know, they use holographs and, and all this technology and things like that, you know, and you're going in there and you go, oh, wow, wow, wow. Of course, now I know all the secrets, you know. But so that was, yeah, so that was, you know, that was my experience with Disney. And then all of a sudden, I'm sitting in a warehouse working on some early models and and I'm working for Imagineering. And so let's let's talk about some of the the models and the projects that you were working on because you were you sort of started off, you know, as this this architectural model builder and now you're sort of at Disney where you're creating and helping to create some of these scale models of what are going to be attractions at Euro Disneyland. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, when you come in, you know, they, they need to assess you, you know, they assess you to see what you're, what, you know, what you're really good at. So they'll, they'll, they always find a good niche for people and they see what their abilities are. And, you know, I had a lot of architectural experience building miniatures for film and carving, you know, like environments, rocks and things like that for, for miniature stuff. And so they, they, you know, my, the natural person or the, the project that put me on was, was the the tabletop miniature of the entire theme park, right? So there's about probably about eight of us mm. working on this eight 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 by four tabletops put together, creating the entire theme park of, of, of Disneyland Paris. And so we're all giving certain portions. So our first phase of this was to start carving up, you know, the rocks, the mountains, you know, Big Thunder Mountain, you know, anything that was that was landscape based. And, and so, yeah, so giving a, a slice of the corner of what, what the rockets I was working on was just happened to be for me, it was happened to be the, 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 the fantasy land castle, Sleeping Beauty's castle and, and all of the berm area and stuff like that. So that was my first carving that I got to work on. And this is all exterior stuff, by the way, at this time. So, yeah, so that's, that's the first thing they do. They, you know, they put you on this kind of stuff. Then as you progress, you know, as time goes by, you know, you're accomplishing things you finally get to the point where you got this finished, you know, you're, you're working with a show producer and, you know, he's the one that's making the final decisions, but you finally get a finished, a finished piece, which in this case, we'll take Fantasy Land Castle and the berm area. And it's like, okay, we're, you know, we're ready to, you know, this is ready for, to chop up and to, to make it so we can build rocks out of this. 
And this is where my my other mentor at, Dis at Disney, his name was Skip Lang. Um, he was my boss, and he basically was the guy who helped build Big Big Thunder Mountain in Disneyland. That was his projects, you know, that he did. And so he was the rock master, you know, that we our our rock guru that we all kind of learned our craft from. And he says, I need volunteers to learn how to do rock work. Please, you know, raise your hand, guys. Who who wants to learn how to do this rock stuff and learn how to do this stuff? Nobody was raising their hands. <laughs> you know, because so working right. on their models. Right. It's not the yeah. sexiest thing to work on when you hear hey, I know, you're, I you're know. build the rock. And I just I kind of felt bad, you know, in a way. So, you know, but I'm looking at him and and I, he's a really nice guy. I love this guy, you know, and we ended up becoming good friends in later years. But I I put my hand up, I go, I'll do it. And he goes, oh, great. Well, I need two more, you know, two more volunteers, you know, so a few more people ended up volunteering. And and so what we ended up doing is learning how to do what we call slice and dice. It was a, it's the process of taking the, the foam rock models and they're all built to scale and you slice them up into eight foot wide or if you're to scale, it would be eight foot by or yeah, it was like eight tall, 10 wide at two level at two foot levels. And you slice these models into these blocks and those would end up becoming what you call cages and those and those would be built full scale using rebar and pencil rod out in a, in a boneyard somewhere what they call the boneyard and and then put into the you know to stack up and build you know stack up over some kind of huge support structure it was a, some kind of i-beam support structure weld it all together and then they put the cement skin on there and carve it up that became your big thunder mountain or it became your splash mountain and so the slice and dice process was very tedious because we had to take these blocks, these, you know, these eight by six blocks, and then we had to slice them two feet increments, mm -hmm. right? So, and then, so each block had all these little sandwich loaves, you know, that you had to do. And then you had to take those and you put them on a big sheet of E-size paper, and then you had to register them to a grid, and then you traced them with a with your pencil, <laughs> Right. And then, and so wait, let's just for a second, Nick, let's give context for a second, because this is what? This is the early, this is maybe like the mid 80s. So, this is the mid, yes. Right. Mid so, 80s, yes. we're, you know, to say that we're on the very early beginning stages of what would potentially be cutting edge computer aided technology and, and modeling and animation is is an understatement. I mean, you're talking about, you know, using things in pencil where now, you know, we were just having a conversation yeah. earlier, you're able to sort of put, designs and ideas into drawing and artificial intelligence can can augment that but you're literally like slicing and dicing by hand and, and doing a lot of this work manually with with paper and pencil yeah yes to the extensive effort that it did to my brain i go home and i would dream <laughs> about slicing telephones and things in my life you know i came back and and I had, you know, I would always explore parts of Imagineering and they and, and Disney had a very uh, unique relationship with with our government and with military government for having first dibs on certain technology that came out and other technological companies that were developing technology. So they always would have things that they had purchased and and they happened to have a what they call a Prohemus digitizer. It was a 3D digitizer and it sat, it was like a pedestal about three feet tall with a grid on it. And it had this little stylus and it used like magnetic resonance. And it would, that little point on the stylus knew where it was in 3D space. Mm. And they also had AutoCAD. And I had my CAD knowledge and I put two and two together and I talked to the IT guy. I said, hey, can we connect this? Can we have this talk to AutoCAD? Because it would be really cool if I could, instead of having to trace all this stuff, if I could just digitize the surface of the skin of the, these things and, and we'll start working with that. And they set up the unit and we did an experiment where I, instead of slicing and dicing, I took one of the blocks and started tracing the, those two foot profiles mm. and created a, a technically the first 3d model that, that we ever did at, at Imagineering, but it was all wireframe and it was all based off of the two foot and, you know, two foot increments. So imagine a, a two foot, by two foot grid for a rock surface and it was just profiles right and but it's the same pro profiles that we needed in order to build a rock and and everyone's like we, we started getting attention and everyone's gathering around and watching us what we're doing and i'm and i'm taking this i'm laying those profiles onto a digital grid which is an e-size drawing and then we had a plotter and we plotted out the drawings 
and no nope, went away go goodbye band saws and goodbye you know you know drafting tables we had a new process in, in play and so they because of that they put me in charge of the first digital design studio for for imagineering so i was in charge of the digital rock system that they came up with so and, and it's um, a system that would be used company-wide like not just for yeah. disneyland paris and but yeah but so Tokyo disneyland and... paris was our you know our prototype project to actually do it with and then from then on in going into the future into now is what the, that technology is what they use it's it's been modified since then but you know there's there's newer ways of doing things especially scanning technologies mm-hmm. and stuff like that but that's but the, the the process of slicing it up and using cad elements is still the same and that, of course that that came to automating the rebar bending because before the uh, the rebar profiles had to be bent by hand on a on a big surface tarmac you know that had a grid painted on it and the poor souls out there you know sitting in the sun <laughs> right. welding and bending these things now we have, you know, it, it runs through, you know, when I was there, we we got it running through a bid ar- rebar bending machine. So you ran the profiles from, from CAD and it went spit out the profiles. And then all you had to do was stack them up in the proper in the proper width. And so we created jigs for doing that. And then we had this whole process in play. And so, yeah, so basically I, I ended up pioneering Disney's digital rock system and, and enhancing it to the point where by the time I left there in 93, that was how all rocks were being done into the future. So that was my that that was my contribution to to Disney. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and it changed not just the process of you know crafting and designing, but executing too in terms of you know concrete three D printing and what would eventually be you know three D printing and some of the work that you did on some of the rock work that you did. And and I think this and I think it's fascinating because and the reason why you know we were talking earlier you know the, the it, it, talking about rock work is not necessarily like the sexy side of, of creating attractions, but it's important because the parks and, and even things like cruise line experiences are storytelling in three dimensions. It's, it's what Walt wanted. It's continues to be the foundation of immersive, immersive storytelling in the parks. And, you know, the importance of placemaking, I think sometimes gets overlooked because of the focus we have on audio animatronic figures, screens, ride vehicles, show scenes, etc., and the placemaking of the rock work, both from on an exterior perspective and interior perspective, is it's it's hiding in plain sight. Like the beauty is hiding in plain sight, and and I love the fact that a lot of this was done for Disneyland Paris, which I believe is arguably the most beautiful in terms of placemaking of all of the Disney parks and. The work that you did was not just on places like Big Thunder Mountain, but Pirates of the Caribbean and Sleeping Beauty Castle as and, and rock work that would be taking place in the future, specifically in Disneyland Paris, right? Some of the rock work there, and, and I love the castle, but Adventure Island and Skull Rock, even inside in Phantom Manor and what I think is one of the most impressive and remarkable parts of the entire park the lair of the dragon uh, underneath the castle. Talk a little bit about the design and sort of the placemaking and the importance of setting that environment so that when we step foot through a threshold or into a, an enclosed space, we are instantly transported to somewhere else. Yeah, there, there's a there's a rule that, that it, working as an imaginary and working in that, in that environment, you 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 come in learning a lot about line of sight details, right? Uh, when you're the way a, a theme park is designed, and 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 your your Disneyland Paris is is a, a very good example of that because they really used it to the max, and that's basically creating that blend from one land to the next. As you go around a corner, there's always there's there's a slight transition, and it and it's a perfect blend of a transition, so you never know that. You're actually going into it. It's not like abrupt change where you're going from Tomorrowland to, you know, to Frontierland or something like that. It's 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 not it's never going to be like that. But there are going to be elements that are designed. So as you do that transition, as you walk around that bend, it, it allows it. So your eye starts telling you that story. So it's a visual storytelling technique that as, you, as you go throughout theme parks. You'll never see any details in anywhere in those parks, from the garbage cans to to the tops of the buildings that do not blend in on on a theme level, and that's how you do it. 
like you know for for dragon slayer i i did not sculpt the interior of dragon slayer that was done by uh, a young lady during that time period and who was just really really detailed and consumed in doing that cavern she studied so much on on working out those caves and so she did the actual foam work on that but it was it was uh, it was my task to take that and digitize it and digit digitize it in a way so we can lay it out into the park and I, I coordinated that installation of, of all those of all that rock and then and then it was our team with five there was five art directors that were sent from from Imagineering that went there um and we all basically were responsible for the carving and teaching the carving and art directing all of the rocks throughout the entire park and, and I wouldn't say 100% of the rocks. So there's a lot of what they call GFRC, which is glass fiber reinforced concrete, which are molds of rocks. So Disney had some of those in a lot of areas, but the major rocks, the big mountains, the big stuff, that's all done through foam carving and chopped up and digitized and then reassembled again. And uh, so we were responsible. So my my top responsibilities, my baby was, was Phantom Manor, the, the whole underground section, the, the crypt. That was my art director responsibility. And then exterior rocks were like African Harbor, the Sleeping Beauty's Castle rock work. And, and, the, and then, of course, the coordinating, I, I was basically responsible for the coordinating of all the rocks throughout the entire 3D park because it was my 3D data that had, had the placement of all of those. So I was actually creating the guides and the installations for everybody so they can put those rocks in the right places, the right elevations, and the, in the right order so everything came together really good. So that was a just a really tough project but a lot of fun so it was a really great time so that so all that that transitional stuff like getting back to the topic is especially for a dragon slayer and and if you ever get a chance to go to disneyland paris it all a lot of the transitions either you can start from the bottom where the waterfalls are and you go into the lair and it all eventually gets you up inside the castle itself or you start from the castle and it's just almost it's just like Something out of some fantasy film, like mm -hmm. if you take Harry Potter for example, example, all those transitions. There's things in there that just you know there's something in there that you're 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 going to see that's going to be going to blow you away. And of course, they have a 60 foot, you know, dragon down there, you know, audio animatronic dragon, and it's, he's nestled inside of his little nest, which is part of this cavern, and he's sitting in, on top of the water, sort of sitting in the water, and he's got there's a lot of steam coming up, and he's got steam coming out of his breath. And he sleeps and he snores and the transition is coming around those until you see him. You, you're going to see his the tip of his tail or you're going to see the top of his head. And then he's there's sensors on him. So if you walk by, he'll wake up, his eyes open. And is it the lucky one well, you might get that big mouth and that big roar, you know. So it's really cool. So, yeah, that's that's the, the level of detail that that Disney puts. And and now, I mean, now with just the way technology is. You know, and of course, I've been I haven't worked for Disney since 2009. So but, you know, I, I did go for my birthday last year. It was my celebration to see Star Wars land and everything in, in Florida. So, you know, to me, that's I'm just, you know, glorifying the the, the work that everybody does there and, and enjoying myself. And of course, my wife is tagging along with it. And I'm pointing out things, you know, details <laughs> and stuff like that. It's like, you know, it's great. It's wonderful. And I, I cherish everyone who ever gets a chance to work and do that kind of work. And I, I thank them for doing such a great job, too. So it must be fast. I was just thinking it must be fascinating for her and other people to go to a park with you because they're focused on the Millennium Falcon. They're focused on the architecture of the building. And I have to imagine your eyes are going to the rock work and the way it is designed and the color and the texture and, and the shadows and the layering. So you must sort of go in because of the projects you worked on and the skill sets you had to develop and the learning process and advancements that happened while you were there. And then since you've been there, you must sort of approach the parks visually from a consumption perspective, probably a little bit different than the average guest. Yes. <laughs> I always, I always look at the layouts. I, I see how things are, where they're organized, how they place things, where the light is, you know, you know, in your mind, you're like, okay, would I have done it that way? Oh, that's a great, oh, that I had never thought of doing that. You know, I tell you, I was working for Branch Technology uh, a couple of years ago, and a friend of mine, a colleague, went there before I had a chance to see it. And he went to the Star, the Star Wars land area. And of course, I he knew I did rock work for Disney. And, and when he came back, 
He gave me a big hug. He goes, I, I looked at all the rock stuff and he goes, I couldn't believe it was the most amazing things. He goes, thank you. I, go, I didn't work on that. And he goes, yeah, but you told me all about it. <laughs> so, But you helped to sort of, you helped to lay the foundation for what would come after. So I have to imagine, you know, you feel a little bit of pride saying I, I helped sort of, you know, create what eventually would become this. And to that point, where do you think in any of the parks that you visited, you think it is just an exceptional example of placemaking with with detailed and and, in rock work well definitely i mean if you look at the the star wars star wars area it's 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 fantastic it's it's excellent also pandora Mm -hmm. and animal kingdom just the transitions coming through and getting around and and starting with audio with you know you have all the the vegetation and everything but and then you if you look at the plants they start the plants, you have the real plants and, and things that are very, probably very exotic tropical plants that they put in there. And then all of a sudden you see things that I don't recognize that, you know, and then you're hearing sounds and you're hearing things. And it's like that, that is not a normal animal that I'm hearing, you know, and, and you pay attention. You got to pay attention to the details. When If you go to those parks, if you go to Pandora and Pandora is a great example. It's just what just look, watch the transitions and pay attention to it and and just and look at the ground the floor the the the, the walkway that you're walking on and and the the imprints that they put into the concrete and the tracks and and then and listen to the sounds and you'll see just the the integration of all the disciplines that come together to make it you know from from electronics technology audio visual painting schemes architectural and the ways and the water and and the and and yeah, uh, all the water features and everything. Uh, it's amazing. So I'd say, I'd say that's a really good example. And of course, oh, what what is the the big Yeti ride? That's an animal expedition animal. Everest. Yeah, yes. Look at that trans those transitions going through the queue line and stuff like that. That's probably one of the best queue lines mm-hmm. that I. That's one of my favorite queue lines because you're being engulfed in the storytelling of of, of the culture that that this mountain exists in. And it's a, a really good example of how, how the Imagineers laid out that that design and style. Well, and I love, too, how the, the rocks have sort of continued to evolve and, and are, you know, they're vehicles for water features and adding a, a kinetic element. Pandora is a great example. Uh, the Moana, the the way of the, the journey of water that, that just is opening now in, in Epcot Center, really this integration that's what as we're talking it this is what making me think as, as i had a chance to to preview it and the integration of the water and the rock work and the storytelling and, and embedding of not just texture but design in the rock and and how it pardon the pun flows so seamlessly with the water as as a storytelling vehicle is really remarkable yeah there's there's early concepts like uh a lot of concept that I've worked on, especially in the 80s, because I did a lot of concept work, too, in my stay there. A lot of stuff never sees the light of day. <laughs> and then maybe somewhere down the road in the future, some of it might get re-exposed. And, and when I when I was back in the 2000s, I had to did some early living character concepts that were living fire, living water, mm-hmm. uh living air, you know, like 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 tornadoes. And all of these things had 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 have a conscious. And they they can live, and when you encounter them, they they will interact with you. And so coming, and then basically when you do concepts like that, you you come up with the you know you you speculate the technology behind it, and then you know so that was put on you know that was basically put in the you know the archives a bit to say hey we'll we'll find a place for this you know, and I I wouldn't be surprised to see some of that stuff coming out. And and what we came up with concept to see a a, a, a waterfall that actually can talk to you, you know, and interact and tell a story or interact with another, you know, element in the environment, you know, those are some, some really fun concepts I was able to work on. I, I, if you ever come to Epcot, I would love to go to Moana journey of water with you just to see your reaction, because I think some of what you are talking about is, has been integrated there, but you brought up something that I, I've always been fascinated with in, in the limited amount to a certain degree that we've seen, which is the living character initiative in the park. I think it is a an incredibly fascinating concept. We've seen it demonstrated a few times in things like Muppet Mobile Labs and, and Lucky the Dinosaur and Wally at D23 Expo a number of years ago. Talk a little bit about your work in the living character initiative, some of the you know approaches to 
the development of some of those different projects and how the how it, it sort of impacts guest engagement. Yeah, a lot of that, you know, we have to start it from the early on. We have to make sure people are going to be interested in, in this. You know, if, if we come up with a living character, you know, we, you know, the first phases of this thing is like, okay, let's, let's come up with a, a concept of what we see this doing. What, who is the best character that we, to start with? In our case, our first, the best character we can come up with was Goofy. Goofy is a very well-known character. He's very prominent. He also has a, he's large. There's a lot of space inside for, for technology, technology to be built that allows the person to interact with, to, to, to do things like if we have pre, pre-canned voices for, for, for Goofy to talk to a, to a guest and, you know, the guest say, Hey, hi, Goofy. And then he goes, Oh, hello there. You know, he'll, he'll be able to respond properly and, and it's in the proper voice and stuff like that. So, so we, so what we do, we build these prototypes. So we build the head, we get the head, we get the the electronics working, the the eye blinks, the the mouth working, all of this stuff. That's all automated to to the voice that's being projected out. So as soon as you hit that voice, the mouth is going to do the right thing, and the eyes will do something. And and then we do we run these through what they call play testing. And play testing is where we then set up a venue somewhere in one of our warehouses, and we bring in children. And we bring in the adults and we bring them in and we bring them in and we let them in and we get their feedback and see what they think. You know, what do you think? You know, what, what did you think about this experience? You know, and and the, with that feedback, that's how we start determining what's what's how it's going to work and whether it's going to be something that we want to keep going forward with. So if it, if, it, if it passed the play test, you know, if it passes what we call the play test phase, then usually then we make the the you know, we will take it to the next level, which is we'll make one working character and we'll put it out in one of the theme parks. And then we'll run it out there for an hour or two and get and see how people react to it. And then we'll do that for a series of times. And then we'll make adjustments to it. And if it's something that looks successful, then this might be something we want to put in all the theme parks, you know. So you always see you always see a lot of testing on the in the theme parks of a lot of stuff. Then a lot of people don't realize there's things out there that they might say, hey, that's really cool. What is that? It might be the first time that anybody's ever seen that, you know. Uh, Wally, I it's interesting because when I went back, when I came back, because I had a lot of experience outside of Disney, I, I ended up working on games and working for DreamWorks, and I worked on projects uh, for James Cameron and stuff like that. When I came back to Disney, they immediately put me in as a show producer because I just backed up, racked up all this other experience, and so I was able to be, work on the Wally robot, the, the show te- for the producer as producing the Wally and got to see him in all the phases that he was going through. So we had a full functioning, full scale Wally. And of course we did our play testing and we ran him around imaginary all the, you know, all over the place. And, and then he of course got to, to make his trips to the theme parks, you know, and that, that's probably the one that you got to see is mm-hmm. when, when, when we released that, that particular Wally. So, and that was so cute. And so it was so much fun. But but that one, you know, it was for me, it was, it, you know, I had nothing to do with the technology. I had nothing to do with the aesthetics because it was already designed, but it was more or less just working with organizing the people to make sure things were just getting done on time. But but being involved in it mm-hmm. was was still, you know, a, a, a great experience. Well, I think it was a huge stepping stone to some other stuff I want to talk to you about, which is where we as theme park guests have continued to evolve to and and in i think was was in in some ways helped propelled by the living character initiative because we no longer want passive experiences right we want some sort of interactive often personalized experiences in the parks not necessarily just with characters that we might meet or or line up for you mentioned earlier you, you mentioned you know cues and part of what you did too was focus on enhancing the queue experience. So the time that you spent in line does not feel like time that you've spent in line, right? It doesn't feel like wasted time. It's not the dreaded time that we have this long wait. And we've seen this evolution from Soren and Epcot to, you know, some of the interactive screens on Winnie the Pooh, even in Peter Pan, it's continued to sort of grow and evolve Talk about some of the the innovation that took place in this Q enhancement initiative for interactive theme park like attractions before you even step foot on the attraction itself. Yeah. So okay. So to to kind of 
set the base tone of what the initiative had to do is first of all, we know our initiative is to <clears throat> make queue lines uh, more entertaining. So that three hour wait is doesn't feel like three hours. Okay, and okay, now we also have to come up with a solution that doesn't shut the ride down while we're doing the installation, whatever it is that we're gonna install, right? So, so what is the technique? What is the technology that we're going to apply? You know, is it, you know, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors that you can do that are very, the illusions are fantastic, but, but it's very simple application. So you're not spending a great deal. You go, uh, the park closes down at night, you send a team in and you can, you can do these alterations, right? So that's, those are the, the things that we had to take in mind because, you know, like for, for Disney World, you know, it was, me and one other person, we went went to the, the parks in August, hottest time of year to be in Disney World. And of course, we're not allowed to take cuts in line to do our job. We have to wait in line because we have to experience exactly what everybody's experienced. So meanwhile, while we're waiting, we got our little notebooks, you know, we're, of course, we're acting normal. Like, you know, we don't want to, you know, you don't wear your engineering shirt and your tag, you take everything off, you know. So you, you you have to be incognito. So you're, we're in line and you're sweating and you're seeing where the air conditioning is working and where it isn't working, <laughs> taking notes. We got to tell them about this, you know, but we're looking at things like, so Big Thunder Mountain, I, and I don't know of any, what got implemented because by that time I was out, you know, things move forward. And of course I'm doing other things. So, but one of the things for like Big Thunder Mountain is we wanted an experience where there were like possible spirits or ghosts that exist in the in the mine shaft as you're walking you know the underground part as you're walking into the queue and what if you could take your camera and you're taking pictures and then you're you're looking at your development and all of a sudden there's a ghost in the picture oh wow you know it's like <laughs> wait you know or there's a message that was written on a wall that you didn't see normally right and you know and so and there were some very simple techniques that we we could do that so we did some you know we did some temporary that could still be there. I don't know. <laughs> Some stuff that on the walls that to kind of proof a concept to see if the stuff was working. I won't go into the, you know, what the effect is because I, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but, but if it's there, if people take, you know, if you go to Big Thunder Mountain in Florida, take pictures in the cave, if you have anomalies that show up on your camera, then we accomplished something that was <laughs> what we were thinking about. So, so, you know, we look at very simple things like that. And then there was, I think for Splash Mountain, we were we were trying to figure out how to like get people into uh, areas as as they were waiting in queue, and then have some kind of entertainment faction going on, and then they would get released into another area. So we were trying to like we had like these you know how do you corral people in in, in sections so we can entertain a group of people at a time, and and then tell a story as they get into into the ride. And then also we looked at using interactive robots, like one of the play testing that we did. And, and I, I don't think this ever got used, but, but we basically re reprogrammed a Roomba robot, a <laughs> vacuum cleaner. And it's just for, for a play test. And we had it. So if you, as you're walking the line, the Roomba is contained as a robot and he could be a character because you could put something, a skin on him. Right. So in our case, we put like googly eyes and stuff like that. And then we have people all lined up around like we're in a cube. And then the thing is, is that if you could get the robot's attention and have them come to you, then it's a game, right? So who could clap the, clap <laughs> the loudest and yell the loudest and start maneuvering <clears throat> the, the the robot character and to come closer to you? And then, of course, you know, that became a game. And, and you know, it was, it's fun because we get everybody out there and everyone's going, hey, over here, clap, 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 clap. And the robot's all confused. And, of course, the very first two or three times, it had no idea what it was doing and it was like doing nothing. And we're like, ah, so we got it to the point where it worked, you know, but it wasn't like, do we want to take this? Is this something that, you know, are we going to make too much of a commotion over something that's, you know, is, you know how fun is this thing really? You know, so that's a, that's a good example of, of things that we were, we were looking at. Uh, other, other very passive uh, enhancements were um, in a lot of cues where you just, there's nothing to look at. We could tell a story using 3D holographic mm -hmm. uh, imagery, and there's a lot of technology that's been developed through the years that 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 allow uh, holographs to really, you know, poster-sized stuff that you could mount without worrying about backspace 
because it's just a wall right there. Mm -hmm. But when you, if you light it correctly, you look at it, all of a sudden you're looking into an environment that's an entire world. And as you walk by it, there's animation because it'll animate as you walk by it. And it's all what they call, it's just, there's no, no electronics involved. It's just through optics and motion. And, and so we played around and had stuff made for various attractions to see if that's something that was very viable. I don't know if we have those in place. <laughs> Somebody would have to say, hey, I saw one of those. <clears throat> so those, that's a good example of, of, of interactive stuff. So, it would, you know, and then, of course, any new, any new attractions moving forward, that's the first thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have to build this in because now, now we have the time to do it right, right? So we're not taking old cues that are boring and trying to enhance them and you can only go so far. We can do it completely from scratch. And that's why what you see when you go to Star Wars and and you know any, you know, like and Animal Kingdom and stuff, it's already thought of as you go through the queue line. So there's a lot of stuff that's that you do. So there's fun things to do until you get until you get to your main main ride. Right, because guest ex expectation is now starting to be there, right? I'm I'm not yeah. expecting just sort of a passive queue with, you know, with velvet ropes <laughs> and stanchions yeah. in between. And a TV monitor, right? A TV right. monitor is just, <laughs> right. hey, uh, put it on your safety belt. Right, you're yeah. not going to have the, you know, the Space Mountain <laughs> queue videos anymore. But it, you know, as we're talking about technology and and the advances of technology. And again, not technology for technology's sake, but technology to enhance the the storytelling. You also worked on not just uh, some of the advances in technology in creating some of the spaces, but in creating spaces as a whole. You also worked on some of the CG and virtual reality experiences. Did you like you to work on Aladdin's magic carpet that was in? Oh, oh my God. Totally forgot about it. Yeah. <laughs> and and even some stuff in Disneyland Paris, right? We were working for stuff for Disneyland Paris too, in terms of augmented reality and, and this the concept, or at least the concept of sort of the magic telescope. Yeah, so that that wasn't for EDL in that respect. The magic telescope was for, for Disneyland. <clears throat> and all again, all of this is blue sky concept development, and we we will build out the technology and we'll test it. And and then somewhere down the road, if it seems viable, then it gets installed. So, yeah, back to mag the Magic Carpet Ride. Uh, when I came back from finishing EDL, they sent everybody home, right? So the park opened up in '93, and we we came home in '92, right, right at the end of the year. And of course, you know, you're on this big long project. It's a five year project, right? And it's like, oh God, you know, what do we do? <laughs> you know, and so I, I go to, you know. I go to the HR, what was equivalent to HR back then, and I said, you know, they go, well, what do you want to work on, Nick? I said, you know, I, I heard, I heard, I, I can't confirm this, but I heard that somebody's working on virtual reality here. And 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 they said, oh, that's John Snotty's team, you know. Yeah, you know, we'll see what we can do. So they were able to get me in. And so I learned going in, I got to be part of John Snotty's VR team. And this big project they were working on was basically to get VR working with a this this visor system mm -hmm. that was tethered to a pole, right? And you could only you, you had to lean into it and then you could rotate, you know, like this. And and that so it had 360 degrees. There was no, you know, there was no head tracking to at any, any point. It was all done through mechanics. And but what was really fascinating is that the 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 machine, this it was a VGX silicon graphics image generator it cost a million dollars the graphics the graphic card on this thing was a million freaking dollars you know <laughs> and you're like holy cow this is amazing but the graphics it was doing was like state of the art at that time yeah. and we were doing 3d 3d world so so i had to go through a course of modeling how to 3d model how to do low poly modeling for this because you know, of course the only you could they could only show i think it was like 50,000 polygons per view you know, any, any one type of view, but it could generate at 60 frames a second, you know, and, and that included terrain and textures and things that apply to it. And so I, I learned, you know, that was my training to get into 3d modeling as far as character work and things like that. And plus all the digitizing I was doing, I was, I was, I was experimenting and prototyping digitizing Disney characters. So I actually got to digitize the for Aladdin for the yeah there's Aladdin Aladdin with with Robin Williams there's a scene 
with the big in the desert with the big panther opening its mouth. And that whole model, as a prototype, I was able to skin it and th- and and basically do a surface skin, polygon surface skin of it, and hand it back off to the to the animation department. So whatever they did with it was, you know, their thing. But but because I had the technology that I was working with was with digitizing rocks, they they put me down and they say, hey, can you do this? So I had all these models coming to me to digitize and do all these surface scans. And then of course one of them ended up I ended up doing a lot of scans for Magic Lab, Mag- the Magic Carpet ride. Right? So we ended up building props and environments and stuff, and uh, that became a, a little feature attraction over at Epcot for the longest time. And then I, I think it ended up moving over to their arcade center. Yeah, uh, Disney Quest. Yeah, it was in I yeah, rem- Disney Quest. Yeah, I remember seeing it in Epcot. Um, it was like Disney Vision or whatever they were calling it. And again, because I was a I still I was I still am like a techie nerd. And I loved you know it's one of the reasons that that I became so enamored with Epcot was this not just demonstration of future technology, but the in, the ability for us as guests to interact with it and see what the future was going to be. I remember making like the first video call, like, you know, in the, in the world kiosks in, in Epcot, but they took this and not only was it just a demonstration of technology, but like you said, they led to the Aladdin's magic carpet attraction over at Disney quest, which really was sort of the first, I know for me, time that that i was able to sort of see it in an environment that wasn't just you know the the imagineering labs at epcot but an environment where you could actually use it and play with it yeah 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 that that got dismantled what in like 2006 or 2007 or something like yeah. that they took all that down yeah. yeah it lasted for a very long time it, course, did. It, it started to show its age last yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so it would never. Yeah, I mean, as soon as as soon as the Oculus came out, it was yeah. Like, uh, but the build your own <laughs> coaster and all those sort of interactive, again, high tech, virtual, but also high touch experiences too. I, I think is is really helped to sort of pave the way for not just where we are now, Nick, but I think sort of where we are going. Again, I think it's it's we and the generation behind us. We want not just tactile but interactive and personalized experiences not just passive viewing so you know you've worked on so many relatively low tech right you were you were cutting rocks in, in you know by hand and, and working on pencil and paper and then working through virtual reality and and you touched on briefly some of the the augmented reality that you were working on for Disneyland where do you think the future of the theme park and i know you did some work on on cruise line and and sort of the implementation of the the theme park experience and even sort of the the cruise experience is going well disney always pioneered a lot of early things that you tend to see later you know, to come out you know in in our in our society right it's like i mean they, they worked on the early prototypes for virtual reality of course there are other companies that were doing that kind of stuff but disney was able to sink a lot of money and a lot of time into creating something that was really pristine and 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 usable and be- viewable and and kind of what make people walk away and, and think about wow this is really cool and you know you walk away thinking about the future and a lot of a lot of the stuff that Disney comes up with is something usually in advance you eventually see 10, 10 years down the way is is coming out in in our real world and for instance like turtle talk in, in Florida and and any of the visual interactive CG character stuff that you Monsters Inc and things like that that were at, at Disney World, that technology was real time puppeteering digital graphics. You had a, a character, a guy behind the scene manipulating, you know, joysticks and voicing the characters and interacting with the audience. So you have interaction, you know, real time interaction and real time feedback and all that stuff. It was it was pioneered by disney and then now you you have digital puppeteering you can do in vr and you can make your own youtube videos <laughs> and i have some some stuff on a uh, youtube channel i have that i've played around with with some of the early technology of that and it's like it was fascinating to me because my god I, the only way i could <clears throat> play around with this stuff was this you know million dollars of apparatus <laughs> that that disney had developed and now i'm playing with a 400 hundred dollar vr headset and i can do exactly the same thing so they're, they're always been a pioneer to do that. So the type of future things that you see, you know, it's amazing because it's hard to say because Disney has access to, they, they buy technology. And, you know, one of our jobs working in Blue Sky was to research companies that were developing state-of-the-art stuff that 
like what can this be used for mm -hmm. you know accelerometers and things like that you know things that were used for eventually to to study roller coasters so disney would send out imagineers and ride roller coasters and get all the telemetry data and and to you know get that information and see how how it was affecting you know people the experience and things like that and then tied into another virtual reality thing they were able to to do that they they had uh the their version of interactive caves to to display you know the new attractions by have, allowing people to walk through virtual reality but without using glasses mm -hmm. right so you sat in a car and then the whole world generated so this is all all projected stuff now you have video walls and virtual studios that are used in the film industry right well disney has been doing that stuff for a long time you know but they were using it for previewing track attractions and making our ride better so they could spend less time, you know, on the design part and, and and be able to perfect it when they start building it out in the field. You know, that technology is 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 everywhere now. You know, so the things that now, God, I I can't, I I don't think I could project my my brain, my little brain into that area because <clears throat> I you know I try to stay on top of things where things are, but I don't have access to the same resources that I did when I was there. So I would love to be able to do that. But yeah, your imagination is as good as mine to try to think <laughs> of what could possibly be happening. Well, yeah, you I know? mean, to your point, you know, you when you were sort of visualizing some of these spaces and walkthroughs or flies throughs, you would have to go to the dish at Imagineering, right? This giant sort of room where where the walls are sort of projected on. And now, you know, that technology is like ubiquitous. It's in your hands and everybody can yeah. sort of see what these spaces and places are look like and and we as guests are doing it i you know we see sometimes imagineers in the parks and they're holding up you know pads and sort of envisioning what the spaces can be yeah. transformed to but i think always you know again I, I just had a conversation with with another former imagineer recently talking about this balance of nostalgia and storytelling and placemaking and technology you know where the the main goals still have to sort of remain the same, right? No matter what the utilization of the technology is, the goal for the the end user, right? For us as the guest has to obviously, you know, remain elevated, but still the same. It's all about the suspension of disbelief, right? You know, I mean, look at what they're doing with drones, right? The, the, the fleet of drones they send up and they can do these wonderful animations. I mean, you're, you're going to see fireworks go away, mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're going to have their place. But now, you know, you have these drones. It's safer. They're programmable. They're spectacular. They're spectacular. You know, they're spectacular. It's amazing. <laughs> you know, I, I think, you know, a, a component that will probably be utilized, and, and Disney does do it, is augmented reality, right? They they have a form of it that they do with their storytelling throughout the park, especially with the, the devices that you can carry in with your cell phone and the apps that you can interact with things. But when the optics are there, when you can wear a pair of glasses, and Disney can then tune you into uh, thematic elements mm -hmm. that are now enhance the park even more, right? I see that as a potential uh, usage that they would use, and they probably would uh, adapt it a lot better than most at first, and then everyone catches on really quick, you know. But it's funny because there's a lot of third-party, you know, developers that are developing really cool augmented reality. We don't know what's happening over <laughs> on the Imagineering <laughs> side, you know. I mean, we know what Meta's doing. Well, kind of. They had their behind the thing. I'm sure Disney's got their hooks into sure. all of this stuff, you know, and they, they might get, be able to present some of it in their in their in our enjoyment of exploring the parks before we get to do it at home. Yeah, and it's you know years from now, probably not that many five, seven, ten, whatever it is. People will go back and go, God, remember when they used to have like those helmets on their heads with the big goggles in front and you couldn't see out? And you know, like you said, what Meta and and Apple is coming out with is remarkable now but in a few years is going to be something that you know the same way we look back on where you were sort of laughing the way you talked about the initial aladdin virtual reality experience that's what the technology is going to look like you know in in probably not that many years because it's just <laughs> it's it's doubling and in, in, at exponential rates yeah and nick you you had such a, a fascinating career i mean i could talk to you all day because you've you've sort of had your handprints in in so many different aspects of the theme park experience, the the cruise line experience, the high tech and and the low tech experience, and but and I have to ask you the unfair question, which you know as you look back at your your time at Disney, are there any specific 
projects or achievements or technologies that you worked on that you are most proud of and and how has it sort of maybe left a, a lasting impact on your continuing approach to design and innovation okay i would say the the project it's it's not a spectacular one <laughs> But it was the most challenging project I ever did. And it, it was the reason why I left Imagineering. It's not, it's not a story I tell very often, but it's like, why did you leave Imagineering? Well, this is why I left Imagineering. <laughs> because I had a group of people come to me and they go, we're building a theme park in Las Vegas. And we have this, this rock work project. And we were told to talk to you because of what you developed for, for Disney. And we can't, nobody else wants to take this on. and and would you be interested? And I went, well, can you tell me more about it? So they flew me to Vegas and we got to look at it. And it was so <clears throat> intriguing to me because this is the challenge wasn't the rock work aspect of it or the fact that it was a theme park. It was the fact that it was a nine month design build, which means it had to be designed and it had it open to the public in nine months. Wow. And one of the people that recommended me, she, you know, she goes, you got to talk to this guy, but you can't do this. Disney, it takes five years for Disney to design a theme park. You guys can't do this, you know? And, and of course, I since I developed the technology that, that Disney was using, I knew the nuances of it. And I went and I looked at what they were doing. And I said, I'll do it. <laughs> so it was probably the craziest move I ever did in my entire <laughs> life. And it was the most challenging thing. So I moved. I packed up my wife. We moved to Vegas. We got a house over there and sat down and so the project i worked on was is the adventure dome and it's a five acre theme park underneath a pink dome yeah. and the 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 it's a it's a grand canyon-esque uh canyon rock work with a roller coaster uh, i think it's a double loop roller coaster and a, a flume ride at least when it opened up they, they changed a lot of the interior rides so i had to do the area development of it the rock work design and figure out how to manufacture the rock work and install the rock work and, and do it in nine months. And I, so my, my approach, which was totally unorthodox and Disney would probably never have ever approved of this. And of course it's not, it's, I don't consider it the best rock work ever. It's, it's not, it's, it's, it's adequate. It does its job, but because what else can you do in nine months? You know, that's the way I look at it. But I basically designed all the, all the, elements of the rock fabrication process completely from scratch digital in CAD wow. from ground zero knowing where everything was supposed to be it was all built up completely digital so there was no model there we had we had a model but it, it was a model that was amorphous as far as we were concerned they said well you know this is what we like it but it doesn't have to look like this you do what you can you know and so you know so we ba you know everything is based off of the, the initial model sculpt that was done but but we were given the priority to do the rock work and get it and get it done so i had to basically just redirect it re-art direct it to to accommodate everything that we were doing and have it look kind of similar to what what the original the base model was supposed to be and behold we did it we opened up <laughs> nine months later and it was like you know <laughs> it was like oh my god but i developed i developed i redeveloped and design the way Rockwork was applied, which a lot of a lot of new systems are using. There's a third party that does a lot of Disney stuff, and they, they call it the potato chip method. Well, that was something I, I came up with developing Grand Slam. I developed an entire surface patch process of building Rockwork, so you didn't have to install these giant cages. It was a lot. It was more like putting a puzzle, a 3D puzzle together, just off the thickness of the skin, you know, and and you apply all that stuff in, in that in that method. So, and that was, that opened up to the public in 19, yeah, 1993. So I, I remember going to the Adventure Dome at Circus Circus a long, long time ago. <laughs> and I, if I remember correctly, there was sort of this, there was like a giant, like Bryce Canyon type mountain, like right in the center of this huge covered, I mean, it was massive. I'm, I'm assuming it's still there, uh, but massive sort of indoor theme park that, that gave it. I remember the rock work in the surrounding area. It, it gave it this sense of natural life and light in inside, or surrounded by all these other attractions. Yeah, yeah, it's still there. It's it's 130,000 square feet of surface area of the rock 
Wow. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> For some reason. Um, also, what was really unique about it is that because it was built on top of a, uh, a parking garage with a six inch slab, we had to minimize the weight. Now, typical rock work that Disney does is is cement, carved cement, top to bottom, right? And and with a thickness of three to six inches. And and the reason why, because you want to be able to carve in some really good details in, into that, and, and and it gives you a lot of lead way to work with. And you can put planners and all kinds of things, you know. So the way Disney Rock works is very specific, and it's meant to last for a hundred years. So with the Venture Dome, everything from the slab to ten feet up is cement, and from ten feet to the top, of the tips of the peaks is is a product called K13, which is a fire fire retardant spray on paper mache material that's used to spray coat steel beams in huge architectural buildings and we dyed it and when it goes on it's very moist and and, and wet and you're you can carve it limitly you know but because it's 10 feet above nobody can touch it so it doesn't feel like paper mache but you can put some shape to it because of the shape of your cage work and we spray that on there. We let that dry. We came back and blended all the paint. And you people don't know. People don't know that. Now they know. If anybody knows, <laughs> you know a secret that, that nobody's known to this day. So, <laughs> All right. So the last question I have for you, and again, I have plenty more in my head, but but you've been so generous with your time. Uh, I know you worked on, uh, you know, I'm sure a, a ton of amazing and memorable blue sky projects that you I'm not asking you to divulge, but if there was one, if if Nick had his own sort of blue sky project, whether it's something that you may have had uh, some work on or something that you'd love to see implemented in the Disney parks, is there anything that that for you you would love to see come to fruition? Oh, man, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I love working on anything that goes there. You know, when when I found out that Star Wars was being built, I was so jealous. I went, oh, my God, I, I want to be there. I want to be there. But, I, you know, I was committed to another job and working for a company and very happy doing what I was doing. But, you know, you, you those projects don't come along when especially my my childhood. You know, I was 14 when Star Wars came out, no. you know. And that spark, that was the spark, right? That was the flame that said, I'm doing this stuff, you know. And when Disney finally was building the theme park, I went, oh, gosh, uh, that's what I wish. <laughs> so if it's anything, you know, like that, I think it, it was done for me already. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, and Pandora, you know, Pandora is the type of rock work. I'm very aesthetic, organic. I love organic stuff. And when there's that kind of beauty that goes into it and, or fantastical and science fiction based, I think they picked the one that that would have been the one I would thought would have thought of. And uh, the the fact that I already got to visit it and enjoy it, that was great. So, you know, I would have to really think about it. And I don't want to spend any more time <laughs> wasting you trying to think of that one project because I could probably come up with five or six. But but that's the one I that's the one I wanted to do with Star Wars. Nice. <laughs> well, it, again, you've had such a, a wonderful and fascinating, interesting career and you're still doing what you love to do and making magic elsewhere. You, you still you. Talk a little bit quickly about what you do now, and then if people want to find you and your work online, where they can connect with you. Well, the the, the one main source is is geekydom.com. It's G-E-E-K-Y-D-O-M.com. That's sort of like my design studio. I I, I have a, a friend of mine that I run that little business with. His name is Blaze Gova. He he's a, a formal Imagineer. He did a lot of uh a lot of Disney classic Disney art for for the collectible series, all the miniature porcelain stuff. Really, just fantastic sculptor, one of the best sculptors I know. So he's my partner in crime with Geeky Dumb, and so that it kind of exposes a lot of the past stuff I worked on and things that we can do for people, which is basically help prototype things out. But that that work is now, you know, I'm going to dedicate Geeky Dumb to more of the collectible stuff more of the fine tune like product development and a lot of more my more efforts going into my new the new company that uh, i co-founded is stract and stract is basically the initiative of stract is to is to bring a uh, form of manufacturing back to the united states utilizing some new technology that we're developing so it's something that i'm really excited about because one of our flagship projects it's going to 
that we're going to be responsible in manufacturing is going to hit Kickstarter in a couple of months. Mm. It's it's the doll for all, which is a articulated collectible doll, 18 inch doll, fully articulated, but it represents pretty much children that have had. Let's see, I would say it's it's tailored for ch- children who have like, like prosthetic arms or or born with certain defects and things like that, but they don't. There's no dolls that represent them. Mm. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a very common one called the lucky fin where they, they, you know, they might just have a, a thumb on their hand. And so we want to, we want to do a, a doll that we could just put that type of feature and have it represent them as a individual. So they have something that they can relate to. And there's no dolls or anything out there like that. And also it's something that would work in the hospitals too, or a lot of the places where they work with children. So it's, it's something that has a lot of, I think, you know, positive value to it and, we're it, trying to figure out how to manufacture this thing is the hardest thing in the world, <laughs> but I'm doing all the CAD work on it and, and we're slowly building it. We got the, the prototype done, but now we're refining it for all the mold work. So, well, I'm going to link to geekydom studios because it, and, and I highly recommend if you're interested that you go and check it out because some of the photos and the concept art and the videos that you have from your work in the theme parks and cruise line and Imagineering and the living characters and that blue sky AR scope that we talked about, as well as your work in film and TV and video games and products is remarkable and it's incredible work. Nick, I sincerely appreciate you not only spending and sharing your time today, but all the work that you have done and put in over the years that is still fortunately being enjoyed by generations of Disney fans around the world. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for having me on your, on your talk show. It's uh, been a pleasure and enjoyed talking with you. Thank it's you. great to, to talk with somebody who's a big Disney fan. I'm, I'm a big fan. Always have been. I will be. So. <laughs> All right. Lightning round. What's your favorite Walt Disney? What's your favorite Disney attraction? Oh, uh, Space Mountain. Which one? Oh, the one in, in, in Disneyland. And then, and then it has to be Indiana Jones in Disneyland. So. Uh, overall favorite Disney park around the world. I hate to say this, but Euro Disney or Disneyland Paris. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> There's no wrong answers for any of these. Favorite restaurant in a Disney park? Oh, Blue Bayou. Disneyland. Nice. Your personal favorite Disney character and why? Uh, Disney character. Yeah, I would say, well, it has to be. Yeah, it's Sorcerer Mickey, right? So. Nice. Since I started. It's time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I not only challenge you to see how well you know your Disney history or trivia or how well you pay attention to what you see here, but you might learn a fun fact as well. And if you think you know the answer, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is brought to you by HelloFresh. If you've listened to the show in the past and know me or have been out to eat with me, you also know that I love to eat. But cooking, not so much. Uh, I never really learned to cook, despite my best intentions. But then, my family found HelloFresh. And with HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. No more running to the grocery store to figure out what to eat, and in my case, impulse buying way more food and snacks than is necessary. Because with HelloFresh, you can skip the trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and, yes, affordable, which is why it's America's number one meal kit. And when it comes to options, let's be honest, more is more, which is why HelloFresh's menu includes 40 recipes and over 100 add-on items for you to choose from every single week. And HelloFresh is more than just dinners. You can also stock your fridge with easy breakfasts, quick lunches, and fresh snacks. And we love HelloFresh at my house. When my two kids were home, HelloFresh made it easy to have a healthy, delicious meal ready to go for all of us with great taste and no waste. And now that my kids are in college, it's even easier for my wife and I to pick our favorite meals or try new recipes with enough food for the two of us. All the recipes, items, ingredients, and portions are all ready to go. Just heat and eat. If you don't believe me, try it yourself. Because if you go to HelloFresh.com slash 5050WDW and use code 50WDW, you get 50% off 
plus 15% off the next two months. Again, just go to HelloFresh.com slash 50WDW and use code 50WDW for 50% off and an additional 15% off the next two months. So this fall, skip the extra trip to the grocery store, have dinner ready in no time with America's number one meal kit. I love it, and I think you will too. Now, before we get to this week's trivia question, let's go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So as last week is part of the announcement from Destination D23, we talked about the new Pirates of the Caribbean Lounge coming to Adventureland in Magic Kingdom and Walt Disney World, and I'll assume, guess, hope that you've been on Pirates of the Caribbean at least once. But how well do you pay attention and look for the details in the attraction? Because your question last week is to tell me, what is the name of the pirate galleon on your left-hand side with Captain Barbosa on the deck that's attacking the fort in the attraction? Thanks to all of you who entered, got this one correct, and knew that the name of the ship is the Wicked Wench. Now, that is the name of the ship in the attraction. And in 2003, which I can't believe is 20 years ago, the Wicked Wench was actually the original name used in production for the ship that would eventually become the Black Pearl in the original Pirates of the Caribbean film. So I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one, and last week you were once again playing for one of the brand new WWW 3D rubber keychains, which look really cool. You can use them for your keys, you can hang them on your backpack. And a mystery prize, and last week's winner, randomly selected, is... Catherine Wong. So, Catherine, congratulations. I'll get your prize package out to you right away, and if you played last week and didn't win... That's okay, because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. This week, we're going to go from Magic Kingdom to Disney's Animal Kingdom, and something that I know that you've seen at least once. Because this week, all I want you to do is tell me what five animals are on the logo for Disney's Animal Kingdom Park. See if you can do it from memory. What five animals are on the logo for Disney's Animal Kingdom Park? You have until Sunday, September 24th, at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there. Again, you're going to play for the WW Radio keychain and a mystery prize. So good luck and have fun. Thank you once again for taking the time to tune in this and every week. I'd love to know from you, What Disney theme park design or technical advancement that maybe Nick mentioned in this episode or even something that he didn't, are you most fascinated by and why? Come be part of the community and conversation over in the WW Radio Clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. Share your answer to the question there as well as anything that you want to talk about in the Disney, Marvel, or Star Wars universe. You can also connect and talk with me on social. I am at Lou Mangiello on all the social channels. You can email me, Lou, at www.radio.com if you have a question you'd like me to answer on the show. Or you can call the voicemail at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WDW1. If you have a question, a comment, or just a hello from the parks, and I will play it on the show. Of course, as much as I love connecting with you online, nothing beats a handshake and a hug. More importantly, being able to experience the magic of Disney together. Check out our events page at www.radio.com slash events or via Facebook at facebook.com slash www.radio. Click on the events tab there. I'll be posting information about our next meet of the month in Walt Disney World soon. But in the meantime, don't forget that we have not one, but two group Disney cruises coming up in 2024 and 2025. First, I'd love to invite you to join us for Halloween on the High Seas on the Disney Magic in 2024. It is a five-night Halloween on the High Seas cruise out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida that takes us to Nassau, Bahamas, and Lookout Key at Lighthouse Point, the new Disney private destination. Plus, we're looking into planning a pre- or post-cruise event on land in Walt Disney World and possibly taking the Brightline train from Orlando down to Fort Lauderdale. Together, we're going to make this a land, sea, and rail adventure. But wait, there's more. Of course, we can't forget about the brand new Disney treasure. And that's why from February 8th through the 15th, we're going to be doing a seven-night Western Caribbean cruise out of Port Canaveral on the Disney treasure. It's going to take us to Cozumel, Grand Cayman, Jamaica, and Castaway Key. And oh, by the way, it also happens to be WW Radio's 20th anniversary. 
And if you want to do something a little different, maybe a little bit sooner, in addition to or in lieu of those cruises, we still have some availability on our first WW Radio Nat Geo Expedition, our Danube Christmas Market River Cruise coming up this December. Plus, thanks to our friends over at Mouse Fan Travel, we've just extended our $750 per person discount on this Danube River Cruise. To find out more about either of the Disney Cruise Line cruises, you can go to www.com slash cruises or go to wdwradio.com slash natgeo23 or wdwradio.com slash natgeo23 to get a quote for our Danube Christmas Market Cruise. Please also go and visit lumangelo.com. In addition to everything I do here on the Disney side of things, I've also been speaking professionally for more than a decade and I've been helping entrepreneurs and solopreneurs launch, grow, and monetize their business and brands. So if your organization, event, or conference is looking for a speaker to come and teach you how to apply lessons from the Disney parks and Walt Disney on customer service, leadership, teamwork, customer experience, and exceeding expectations and sort of creating your own Disney-like culture and experience in your organization. I can customize a presentation that is practical, tactical, and inspiring. And if you're looking to leverage some of those additional lessons and also take your business and brand to the next level, I'd love to work with you through one-on-one coaching, my weekly mastermind group, and events like my Momentum Weekend Workshop in Walt Disney World, my Momentum Retreat. Again, you can find out more. Send me an email if you have any questions by going to lumangelo.com. Thanks, as always, to my partner and travel provider, Mouse Fan Travel. It's who I have recommended because it's who I have used and trusted for more than 17 years. Whether you're going to any Disney destination or any vacation location on the planet, visit Mouse Fan Travel, not just for the fee-free travel services, but really because of the expert knowledge and personal service that is really their hallmark. Again, you can visit them over at mousefantravel.com. And as always, my friend, and you are my friend, whether we have met yet or not, All I ask is that if you like the show, please help spread the word. Tell a friend. If you're listening on your phone, take a screenshot right now. Share it on social. Tag me at Lou Mangiello and invite a friend not just to listen to the show, but be part of this incredible community that you have created. If you're listening on Spotify, please leave a rating there or on Apple Podcasts. You can leave a rating and review. Thanks to Yoga E7717, who says the show is addicting. I love the show. I've listened to every single episode. It's opened my mind to podcasts. And finally, most importantly, thank you, thank you, thank you. I would not be able to do any of this without your love, support, friendship, and help. Thank you for being part of this community, my extended family, for being part of the WW Radio Nation. You can find out more over at www.radionation.com. And thank you for always remembering, or trying to remember, to choose the good, and not just looking for the good and the things that you experience, but being kind and patient and polite and courteous to other people. Simple things that sometimes are are lost, but have this incredibly wonderful, positive ripple effect. I hope that this is your best week ever. I hope to see you Wednesday night on the live show. I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you. See ya. Lou, this is Brenna from Denver, Colorado. I uh, just listened to your show, and you asked about some ideas for future top tens, and I saw this video um, from Good Morning America about... Um, a new attraction going up in Epcot, Moana's The Way of Water. And the point of it is to connect people at the park with the water and to show them the way that water works and moves in their lives. And I happen to be a water resources engineer, so I totally geeked out. I'm really excited to see that, to see what it looks like. So anyway, my idea for a top ten would be top ten attractions that maybe promote science and engineering or STEM, but maybe like the top 10 things in Disney World or Disney that promote a love of STEM. So anyway, hope you're having a good one. Everybody take care and see you later. Bye. Hello, it's Patrice Roberti from Metro Boston. I, last night I heard number 744 and you were talking, you said We've all gotten choked up, gotten a little weepy at the sight of a corn dog. And you must know, of course, that Marcel Proust, with his Madeleine, his little cake cookie there, said uh, his Madeleine, the, the Madeleine de Proust, is an expression used to describe smells, tastes, sounds, reminding you of your childhood or bringing back emotional memories from a long time ago. Well, obviously, those corn dogs are doing it for you, and you know what? 
it's just as marvelous as Proust and even better because can you imagine, I mean, Proust only had that little cookie if he had had a corn dog, but it was the same thing. That corn dog wasn't today's corn dog for you. It was uh, describing the past long ago, recently, and it's a good corn dog too. It was a great moment. You should be, it was just, it was, it was just, someone should give you a round of applause for that, for, for letting a corn dog mean that much to your emotional memories. It was quite beautiful. Take care. Bye.